Now that we've finished talking about the first law of thermodynamics in detail, let's progress to discussing the second law, which concerns spontaneous processes in the universe and a new state function called entropy. In this series of videos, we're going to introduce the new state function entropy, talk about its conceptual meaning, and see a few different examples of how to calculate it, and ultimately come to a condition on processes that occur spontaneously within the universe, which amounts to the second law of thermodynamics, this condition. To begin, let's start by defining what we mean exactly by a spontaneous process and talk about the idea of a chemical potential. The first law, just to jog our memories, states that energy is conserved in the universe and that a change in internal energy is equal to the sum of heat and work for a process. There are processes, however, that obey the first law of thermodynamics that do not occur in practice without outside intervention. Here's an example of one such process. So you'll see on the top left of this figure a faucet at the top. That faucet is delivering water to a trough near the top of the apparatus. There is a place in that trough where water falls onto a water wheel, and as the water wheel spins, it pumps water upward from below. Since the energy provided by the water falling from the top is just enough to pump the same amount of water up to the same height, in this case, delta U is equal to zero. So in theory, this apparatus ought to be able to run forever, right? Since the amount of energy provided by the falling water is equal to the energy needed to pump the same amount of water up. However, we would find in practice, we would find empirically, that it is impossible physically for this device to run forever. Eventually, such a device will come to a stop. So because this device is consistent with the first law, it obeys the first law in every way, shape, and form, but the process does not occur spontaneously, we need a new law of nature to characterize spontaneous processes. And that's what the second law is concerned with, explaining why, for example, on a deeper level, a water wheel like this won't run forever. What do we mean by spontaneous process? Well, we mean one that will occur within a system without outside intervention. For example, without an external source of energy to drive the process. A spontaneous process is one that sort of just happens without influence from the outside world. One thing to note about the second law and thermodynamics in general is that spontaneous processes may be fast or slow. Thermodynamics really has no notion of time because it deals only with systems in equilibrium, systems that are unchanging with time. For chemical reactions in particular, we think of a spontaneous chemical reaction as one that converts one set of concentrations to another. And this is a point I'll return to again and again as we talk about thermodynamics, this idea that although we can think of a spontaneous chemical reaction as converting reactants to products, in fact, no reaction goes to completion entirely. We'll see this idea in more detail when we talk about chemical equilibrium in a later video series, but it's very important to keep in mind that we need to account for concentrations when thinking about spontaneity, and complete conversion of reactants to products is never a spontaneous process. Now, 99.9%, 99.99% are achievable in some cases, but we want to understand exactly what those concentrations are in a spontaneous chemical process. The second law, as we've hinted at so far, amounts to a fundamental criterion on spontaneous processes. To show you an example of a spontaneous process, I wanted to demo this reaction, from, which is the reaction of Mg2Si with sulfuric acid in aqueous solution. Notice that as soon as the reactants are brought into contact, the reaction goes immediately without intervention from the outside world. And in fact, it goes very vigorously and very quickly. So this is a nice example of a very fast, spontaneous process. So how do we go about developing a criterion for spontaneous processes? Well, we can take some inspiration from physics. In physics, for example, we can note that spontaneous processes tend to involve a decrease in some kind of potential energy for a system, be it electrical potential or gravitational potential. We've seen numerous examples now of Coulomb's law and the idea that electrons and nuclei 
come together, move together spontaneously because of Coulombic attraction. A good example from physics is the falling of a ball spontaneously in a gravity field until it reaches a minimum in potential energy. So a ball will fall from a height above the ground until it hits the ground, and that represents a decrease in gravitational potential since the height of the ball is decreasing. What we want to know from a chemical thermodynamics perspective is, is there a chemical analog for gravitational potential energy, some kind of chemical potential that we could ascribe to, say, a chemical system with a particular set of concentrations of reactants and products. We're going to find that there is, and we're ultimately going to denote it with the letter G. And so, to show you an example of what a spontaneous chemical process might look like in terms of this hypothetical chemical potential, take a look at the diagram that's here. We can imagine if, for example, the chemical potential of the reactants is higher than the chemical potential of the products, then a spontaneous chemical process leads to a decrease in chemical potential. We can think of the process occurring as going downhill, and therefore it's spontaneous, just like a ball rolling down a hill. Note the correspondence between the falling ball here and the falling chemical potential here. To really unearth the nature of chemical potential, we have to look at spontaneous chemical processes in a little more detail. A good first candidate, if we think about empirical experience, is enthalpy. Could G simply be equal to the enthalpy H? What we know from empirical experience is that a great many exothermic processes are in fact spontaneous. A great example is the thermite reaction. Let's take a look briefly at one example of a spontaneous exothermic process that releases heat. In this reaction, two moles of aluminum react with Fe2O3 to produce molten iron, and you'll see the delta H value there is negative 850 kilojoules. So that is quite a bit of energy released. And this is a spontaneous reaction. As soon as the reactants are given a little bit of a spark and allowed to come in contact, the reaction occurs spontaneously. And you can see the molten iron collecting on the ground below the bricks. Spectacular reaction, the thermite reaction. If we're going to make enthalpy our chemical potential, that means any process that decreases enthalpy, any process for which delta H is less than zero, any process that releases heat at constant pressure, is another way to put this, is spontaneous. On a diagram like the energy diagram we just saw, enthalpy decreases in going from the reactants to the products. The problem with this model is that there are a number of endothermic processes that are also spontaneous, and I want to show you one example of an endothermic spontaneous process right now. I'm going to put a small puddle of water on this wooden block. And then place this glass flask on the puddle. Next, I'm going to add some solid strontium hydroxide octahydrate. And then, some ammonium nitrate. When these two solids are mixed physically by stirring, a reaction takes place that liberates the waters of crystallization that are included in the solid strontium hydroxide octahydrate, leading to a slurry of liquid water, dissolved ammonia, and strontium nitrate. The liberation of water dramatically increases the entropy of the system, which drives the reaction, even though the enthalpy change is actually very unfavorable. That is, the reaction is very endothermic. How do we know it's endothermic? Well, let's see. As I'm stirring, the solids are becoming a bit wet, and I can smell liberated ammonia. That escape of ammonia as a gas also dramatically increases the entropy of the process. And now I have a fairly complete reaction. And if I lift the flask from the block, whoops, I can't lift the flask from the block. The reaction is so endothermic that it has taken heat from the puddle of water 
freezing it to ice that now bonds the flask to the block. And indeed, I can feel the cold through my gloves. So not everything in that video would have made sense just yet, but what's clear at least from the demonstration is that a decrease in enthalpy, the fact that a reaction is exothermic, cannot be the only criterion for spontaneity because there are endothermic spontaneous processes as well. There are many processes that are spontaneous for which the enthalpy change is zero, in fact. One hypothetical process for which the enthalpy change is zero involves the mixing of ideal gases in an isolated vessel. So imagine, for example, two gases, red and blue, with equal volumes on either side of a rigid partition within a container that's perfectly isolated. So perfectly rigid and perfectly insulating walls such that no matter can come in or leave and no energy can enter or leave. What happens when we remove the partition? Do any processes take place spontaneously within the now completely open box? Well, of course, the gases spontaneously mix, but the temperature and the product of pressure and volume are constant throughout the mixing. So that means that delta U, because it depends only on temperature, right, for an ideal gas, is equal to zero, and delta H is equal to zero since P times V are constant for both gases throughout the mixing. So the change in internal energy and the change in enthalpy are both zero here. But what exactly is going on here and what makes this process spontaneous? One thing worth noticing is that upon the removal of a constraint on the system, more precisely upon the removal of this wall separating the two gases, which we can think of as a constraint, the gases spread themselves out uniformly over the entire accessible volume of the container. What we find is that there is a natural or spontaneous spreading of the kinetic energy of the particles. And this idea that energy spreading characterizes spontaneous processes is one valuable way to think about the second law of thermodynamics. To capture the second law in quantitative or mathematical terms, what we're looking for is a state function that captures this dispersal of energy. And we'll get it in the next video.